um, since the since you know the first week of January. Um, so that's you know thanks to the the stay at home order and all of the hard work that everyone has done and the sacrifices people have made um, to reduce transmission seem to be paying off. Um, next slide, please. And that has led to um, the yesterday. Uh, the governor announced that the stay at home order was lifted. The data over the weekend um, showed that our projected ICU capacity um, across our region was over a four week period was above 15%. That was the, the, the metric that was looked to, to for the stay at home order was based on ICU capacity. And it was a model that looked at both case incidents, the R naught, which is called the reproductive rate, um, as well as hospitalizations and ICUs to come, with, with come up with a composite measure looking out a month ahead to see how are we doing with regards to our projected ICU capacity. And that number when it's above 15% was the indication for lifting the stay at home order. So that announcement was made um, to many of our surprise, uh, but, but uh, pleased yesterday morning that we have been moved from the, uh, from the stay at home order into the purple tier. This is a familiar for us. The purple tier is, is um, where, where we were for the majority of, again, November and, and the beginning of December. So we're returning to that status in Marin County. We will not be imposing any further restrictions on top of what the state allows in the purple tier. Um, one important thing to note is that our numbers here in Marin, we have a, a case rate of about 40 cases per 100, uh, 40 cases per 100,000 residents per day compared to about 105 at the, at the state. Our percent positivity is 5% compared to 15 in the state. Um, so we are less than half of the less than half of the average cases in the state, and and one third of the percent positivity across the state. We also have testing rates that are about twice uh, the state average. Next slide, please. So this is what the purple tier means for us. Um, now allowed that had not been allowed in the stay at home is we are able to engage in outdoor dining, um, hair and nail salons, personal services are now open, hotels, motels, short term lodging. Uh, retail and malls are able to open a little more in terms of their indoor capacity. Small private gatherings, the social bubbles we've talked about are now resuming outdoors with the three household maximum. And the policies regarding schools are, are unchanged currently because they had not been changed in the stay at home status. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll end uh, that section by just reminding us that, um, you know, if I have any concerns about moving into a more, a less restrictive tier is that people might see that as a, as a sign that the coast is, is more clear, that we could let our guard down um, and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, we are at risk of backsliding if we misinterpret this as, as safety we still have, we are still in deep purple. We are twice the number that we would need to be to move into the red tier. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's, as one of the, 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 the callers already mentioned, with the emergence of new strains that may be more infectious, it's really important for us to continue to practice physical distancing, covering our faces. All the things we've been doing to, to flatten that curve need to, be, need to be maintained as we roll out the vaccine. I'll move into the vaccine update now. Next slide, please. So this is our new dashboard. Um, you know, in, in spirit of, of trying to share with our with our community um, any relevant data for our you know, for our collective understanding, um, we've added some metrics to our, our our dashboard relating to our vaccine distribution plan. And this is the number. This is today's numbers. Um, it's updated daily. It's about a two-day delay, so there's actually more people who have been vaccinated than are, than are reflected here. Um, but it shows that um, 23,953 people in Marin County have been vaccinated. Um, actually, that's the doses that have been administered. It, and this corresponds to uh, just over 20,000 individuals have been vaccinated. So nearly 8% of our population has been vaccinated. The lighter blue is the first dose, and the darker blue is the second dose. Next slide, please. And then this shows, um, like our epidemic curve in terms of the number of cases, this is going to show each day a bar that corresponds to the number of people who have been vaccinated. And what we're seeing is that is that has been increasing as our supplies have 
slowly but steadily increased on average. Uh, we are now vaccinating just about 1,500 people per day in Marin County, and that that you know as we get more supply, we will continue to vaccinate more individuals. Our goal is to make sure that supply itself is a limiting factor in terms of how many we're able to vaccinate and not our operations or not our, not our ability to get needles into arms. And that is currently, we are, now, we are successful in moving vaccines forward as soon as we get them. And, uh, and we're, we're hoping for more soon. Next, please. This is, uh, just shows where our, our, our mass vaccination site is. So to, to that goal of vaccinating as many people as we can, as soon as we get doses, the way public health manages this, rather than having it diversified in, in clinics that may not have the capacity to manage the cold storage, this is the, the mRNA vaccines are, are high maintenance vaccines. It's not like the flu vaccine or other vaccines where we can just distribute them across the county to our healthcare providers. It really needs special infrastructure, special registration processes, special handling, um, and, and special refrigeration. So, and the most efficient way to actually move through, you know, what will eventually be you know, 500,000 or more vaccines for our community as a whole is to establish mass vaccination sites where we're able to efficiently, efficiently move through large numbers of people um, in, in a matter of hours. And that's uh, our, our mass vaccination site. The primary site like this is at the Marin Center. Um, it's the site where we had done uh, mass testing um, and then where we also had our uh, alternate care site and has now been transformed for its third, you know, for its third life in our COVID-19 response to be a, a, a vaccination site. This is the entrance to that pod, the point of dispensing site. Next, please. And this just shows what the process is. So this is where people are able to go through sort of Disneyland style queues where we're able to move uh, multiple people through. It's a large indoor space with adequate physical distancing. Next, please. And it will move through there, get registered, and then move on to um, the multiple channels where, where people are actually, our healthcare workers are actually providing the vaccine itself. Uh, we're able to do three vaccinations per minute in this site uh, and could expand beyond that if we had more doses to offer. Next, please. After the vaccination occurs at the point of dispensing, individuals are checked out and then they have to wait for a period of 15 minutes in an observation area for any, any adverse reactions that might've occurred to the vaccine. We have had not had any adverse reactions that were serious in this setting now with over 13,000 people um, in Marin County having been vaccinated at our point of dispensing site. Next, please. So what groups are being vaccinated in Marin? This has been this has been a source of, I think, confusion nationally as we try and prioritize different groups and they're prioritized in different ways and those, and those strategies change both at the national and at the state level over time. So I think we can be really clear on what's a very simple strategy for us in Marin right now, which is we are vaccinating healthcare workers. That's the group we started with when we first got vaccines in mid-December. Um, we are almost through with all of our phase 1A healthcare workers. Um, and so the, the door remains open to them. Um, and then we are starting now to vaccinate persons age 75 or older. And this is true for Marin Public Health, for Kaiser, for Sutter, and for Marin Health. Those are the, you know, those are the four main arms of our vaccine distribution in the, in the, in the county. It's our three hospitals and the related systems in which they operate and then public health. We've all agreed together to focus our next 25,000 doses or so on our, our oldest and most vulnerable residents. Next, please. So why focus on older residents? First is that there is a limited and uncertain supply. We as a county receive zero to 7,000 doses per week. Um, that's what been one of, the, one of the concerns and I think frustrations across the nation really has been the unpredictability of of the, of the doses when they may arrive and how many. We find out on a given Wednesday how many we'll have for the following week. Uh, more than once we've been um, had, had zero doses come and other times we've had many more. So that unpredictability um, has really required that we have some stability and standardization and simplification on the demand side. Um, we also know that uh, older residents are highest risk for hospitalization and death. Um, and I'll share more about that shortly. 
We wanted to simplify the criteria, as I said. And we have 23,000, more than 23,000 residents in Marin County are age 75 or older. So even just by focusing on that group, it will still take us up to several weeks, depending on our supply, again, to get through that most vulnerable group. Next, please. And this is some of the epidemiology and some of the, the data and the science that, that it leads to this decision to focus on age 75 or older. These are, this is Marin County data. And what you see on the left there is the mortality rate. So that is the, the risk that someone may die or the, or the number of people who have passed who have been infected in these different age groups. So well less than half of 1% of our individuals age 49 or below who have been infected with COVID-19 have passed away. On the far right, you see among it, people who have been aged, people age 75 or greater, almost 15% who were infected have passed away. And if you look on the right there, what, what that means is that a vaccine given to someone age 75 or older is 332 times more likely to prevent a death than a vaccine that is given to someone age zero to 49. 34 times more likely than one offered to someone age 50 to 64 and four times more likely to prevent a death than a vaccine given to age someone 65 or 74. And because we don't even have enough vaccine for that most vulnerable age 75 and older, we thought it was important to really continue to focus on that group as the first tier given the extreme rationing we need to do at this point. Next, please. A lot of community members have, have asked, when will they know it's their turn? This is a question that's coming up uh, you know, across the state. We wanna help our, our residents answer this question as, as clearly as we can. Um, and to that end, we've established on our website at coronavirus.marinehhs.org slash vaccine, a site where people can go and fill out a vaccine interest form. We have about 26,000 of our residents now have already filled this out and we'd love for everyone to. Basically, it allows us a chance to, um, for, for our residents to enter certain characteristics about themselves, their age, their zip code, race, ethnicity, any medical conditions that will allow us, as we move through the tiers, to do proactive outreach back to those individuals, say, okay, your group is up now. And then at that time, depending on where the, where the vaccines are being offered, we can offer a list of the, of the places people can go to get appointments. That list will grow over time as we have more doses and as are there more as there are more locations to become vaccinated. So please go online and fill out the vaccine interest form. Next, please. And then similarly, how do I get an appointment? So when, once you know when your tier is up, how would you get an appointment? This was also on the website. What we will continue to display is across the county, all of the locations where vaccines are being offered, both through our healthcare provider, so Kaiser, which has its own independent supply, which is intended to be used for their own members. Sutter, similarly, for their own members. Marin Health, Marin Public Health. And then as pharmacies come online, we're, we're hearing from the federal program that there's gonna be more and more pharmacies. CVS, Rite Aid will be supplied vaccine to offer to the offer to communities. And there will be in parallel more and more locations where people can get vaccinated. And those will be shown here uh, at this website where um, once, your, once your tier comes up, you're able to go and, and book an appointment through those vaccination options. Right now, it is extremely limited. I said, as I said, we're only getting between five to 7,000 doses per week, um, which is less than 1,000, uh, you know, about 1,000 per day on average that we're able to offer. Next, please. So I just wanna forecast out what one month from now feels like or looks like from my perspective. Um, because I think it's hopeful. Um, one month from now, our healthcare workforce is going to be protected through vaccine. The majority of our healthcare workers have already been vaccinated with one dose and many have been vaccinated with two doses. That's a, that is a game changer for us in terms of what we have been so concerned about in terms of being able to manage our healthcare workforce who have been exposed to COVID-19 as patients have surged into hospitals and ICUs. Knowing that they are protected beyond the protection offered by PPE, by the vaccine itself, is going to, I think, allow us all to breathe more easily as we face the next few months of this pandemic. Um, we also will know that as we focus on our age 75 plus, now we're vaccinating more than 1,000 a day in that group. Those who are most at highest risk for death will be protected one month from now. Um, again, the risk of death is, is you know, one in seven, 
of our residents who have been above age 75 who have been infected with COVID-19 have passed away. That will change significantly one month from now after we've worked through the majority of people in that community and we will continue to vaccinate our older members as long as we need to. Um, there will be a clear federal plan and more doses from the state um, available. Um, we're, promised, we're being promised that, that Moderna and Pfizer, the manufacturing is you know, continuing and we may have another, another vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine may be coming online. We'll be vaccinating more groups um, by, by age, moving down to other age groups and by occupation. Um, and there will be more locations to obtain the vaccine, the pharmacies, more points of dispensing as the one I just described, and also in healthcare settings will be vaccinated. Next, please. So in summary, our case rates are, our case rates are declining in Marin County. Um, that third surge is resolving. The stay at home order lifted. We are in the purple tier. Um, vaccine distribution is underway. The supply is, is really the sole determinant of our rate right now. We have more operations in place to be able to vaccinate people than we have vaccine. And we'll continue to um, offer more vaccines exactly as we are supplied. Um, we're focusing on our healthcare workers in age 75 and older. Everyone eventually in our community will be offered the vaccine um, and it's a matter of time. Um, and we are, our goal is to prevent a fourth surge. Um, the vaccine is not going to be arriving quickly enough to, for that to happen automatically. It's going to be based on our own behaviors. So we'll need to continue to cover our face, practice physical distancing, and avoid inter social gatherings, particularly concerned about the Super Bowl. We've seen the role of Thanksgiving, of Christmas, of New Year's, very, very clear and measurable increases in cases after these large social events where people gather in more, in more numbers in, indoors. Um, so this is one reason why I was not too upset that some of, one of our local teams didn't make it into the Super Bowl because we're less likely, less incentivized to need to gather together to watch it. Um, next, please. And this was this this was earlier this week. So this is my office. I my office is down here in, in the canal at the Kerner campus, this is the Marin County Health and Wellness campus. Um, and this was my view from my office window. Um, earlier this week as they were setting up the point of dispensing in the, in the canal area. This is obviously one of the ways in which we're addressing the disproportionate impact on that particular community. It's already been referenced by one of the callers by actually establishing a smaller point of dispensing that corresponds to the size of this facility, like the one I described at the Marin Center for, for, the, for the canal area and other low income communities. This is a point of dispensing that is now offering 400 vaccinations um, and this was the, our, our uh, Department of Public Works setting up that, that pod. Um, and I think the, it, it speaks for itself what, what, this, what, what this represents in terms of, of the hope of, of what the vaccine can mean for us as a community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Willis. So board members, questions, Supervisor Connolly. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Willis. I want to hone in on vaccines. It's certainly the issue that's top of mind for everyone. Uh, we hear from folks every day throughout the day about it. And, and so we want to make sure that everyone has uh, the most up-to-date information and, and uh, the ability to access information. So thanks for your efforts. I'll try to just consolidate some of the questions we've been receiving. Uh, one of which I think you already answered, but it, it bears repeating. And um, it's really uh, the notion of how many vaccines has Marin received or currently has, which are not being administered. And I understand you uh, again here today to be saying no vaccines are being left in the freezer or on the shelf in Marin. Is that right? Yes, so we, you know, again, I said we receive anywhere from zero to 7,000, looking back over the past five weeks, we get weekly allocations from the state. We, we ask for as much as we can get. So there's a, you know, there's a, a request form. We, because we're moving through the vaccines as quickly as we get them, we're always maximizing our, our request. Um, it's, you know, from a planning standpoint, we've, we find out on Wednesday when we're, the amount we're getting and that immediately goes into appointments 
across the county at the point of dispensing in the canal area, at the point of dispensing at the Marin Center. Those get translated immediately into, into appointments. We also allocate some to Marin Health Medical Center. Kaiser and Sutter are getting their own supplies. So for what the county has control over, our goal is to have less than 1,000 doses at the end of the, each week. The reason we are able, we're reserving some is for, the, for those first few clinics that start in the following week. Um, and we've been successful in that goal. The, the, having the point of dispensing that I, that I mentioned at the Civic Center is a really efficient tool for us to be able to upregulate or downregulate appointments because we can expand capacity there very easily. So if we were to get more doses, say we you know, surprised by a greater allocation, which is always our hope, um, we can just immediately open just more visits. And that's how we're able to just make sure that we're keeping pace with the supply we're given. Great. How many vaccines has Marin administered to those who do not live in Marin? And will Marin get any credit for the counties of residents? Yeah, the, the data system that is available to us um, tells us the Marin County residents that have been vaccinated. Uh, it doesn't give us data on the number of people within Marin County that have been vaccinated. And because we have, you know, as I mentioned, uh, Kaiser is vaccinating, Sutter is vaccinating with their own supplies. CVS Walgreens has their own supply and they're, they're vaccinating in long-term care facilities. There's also uh, a supply going to San Quentin State Prison for inmates who, um, who are getting vaccinated there. And that, and that is another important point that that, that community is now um, largely protected through vaccine, through, through vaccinations that happen through CDCR. So those are all different, different um, mechanisms of vaccination we're in. We don't have visibility on all of those just because we don't have access to that data. What we do have access to is the number of Marin County residents who have been visit, uh, vaccinated through the state data system. We know that you know, our, it's, it's mainly if, if you're, if you're vaccine, vaccinated based on your occupation, you're vaccinated in the county in which you work. If you're vaccinated based on your other characteristics like age, you're vaccinated in the county where you live. So some of our healthcare workers who, who work in the city would have been vaccinated there. Similarly, some people who, who, who live outside of the county but work in Marin, our healthcare workers would have been vaccinated here. So it, 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 it may wash out at the end. I'm not sure where, where that swing is, whether we vaccinated more or less of our own residents. The point is that we want to get as many people vaccinated as we can. When and how will assisted living centers be vaccinated? So assisted living centers are, are being vaccinated now. So first, we, we've we've invited um, you know, proactively outreach to assisted members of assisted living facilities to come into the, the point of dispensing site to offer them offer them appointments. Um, those that can't travel, we have mobile teams who are going out to assisted living facilities. Um, we're heading out to uh, this week because there's been some, we're prioritizing those where there's any, any activity, any cases. So I think it's um, Alma Villa and Deer Park are two assisted living facilities that are, the mobile team will be visiting this week to offer vaccines. Great, and how can individuals without internet access, for example, uh, some of our seniors uh, who are currently eligible for vaccines make an appointment? Is there a phone number they can call? Yeah, that, that's being built. So we, right now we're, you know, we re recognize that this sort of first group of our 75 plus um, are, are those who are able to actually schedule appointments online. Um, as, we work, as we work through this group, again, 23,000 members, just above age 75, um, working with, uh, with our aging, and aging Action Initiative to establish a phone bank where there's a, a telephone number, which we will share with the community once that's established for people to call in and, and basically where an individual can actually register that person um, telephonically and offer them an appointment to come in. And then, then those in that subset who actually can't, can't travel to the site um, arrange a, a process for them to either be given rides or for, for paramedics or others to actually visit their home to, to be vaccinated. Great, and you reference the vaccine page. Thanks for the ongoing work on that. Uh, it's unfortunate that the CVS Walgreens numbers are not captured in Marin, Marin's counts. Uh, do you have a sense of how many have been vaccinated in our long-term care facilities by CVS and Walgreens? And can we kind of 
capture that information ultimately as well. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a you know frankly it's been a frustration that we don't have more visibility on that process. We just got the list from CVS Walgreens in terms of the their schedule. Um, we are we are you know doing a divide and conquer with with uh, CVS Walgreens. They have their own do doses, which is important for us, so that we don't want to. Um, you know, if, if it's going to be too long before CVS and Walgreens gets to one of our facilities, we will send our mobile team out to vaccinate in that facility. But if they're scheduled to be there a week from now, we would make that calculus to actually go ahead and hold on to our doses and reserve them for our residents and allow CVS Walgreens to do that. Um, so I don't have the exact number. I know they've been to more than 58 facilities together, the CVS Walgreens uh, partnership. Um, and we've been to probably a similar number in our own, with our own mobile teams. We started in SNFs. Our first, the first day we got doses, we went immediately to our skilled nursing facilities and vaccinated staff at, at all 13 of our skilled nursing facilities over the first five days, because we did, we were not satisfied that, you know, CVS Walgreens would, would be fast enough. And that was obviously such a source of, of cases and, and mortality for us. Um, so we're, we're, we're combining with them. And as soon as we have those numbers, uh, we will add them to the website. I imagine we'll see a dramatic increase in the number of people who are recognized to have been vaccinated in Marin. Great, and then final question, <laughs> kind of picking up on your rainbow slide uh, with a note of caution maybe as well. And really that goes to how people should be thinking about uh, vaccination, but also behavior. Uh, current guidance is that even if you have been vaccinated, you should continue to wear a mask, maintain social distance, and wash your hands. So looking, at, looking a little bit ahead uh, in a rainbow-esque fashion, I mean, how do you see things playing out as a vaccination uh, process takes hold? Uh, people are continuing to... Uh, adhere to these precautions. We're in purple now. Hopefully we, we continue to move through the tiers. Um, where do you see things, how do you see things playing out, uh, giving people a little bit of a roadmap? Yeah. I mean, I think but by far the most important determinant of our, you know, our tier um, and um, our case rates is going to be our own behavior. Um, for a while, uh, you know, right now, only eight percent of our of our community has been vaccinated. Um, that's not nearly enough, you know, for, for herd immunity. Um, so we all need to continue to, you know, practice those, you know, especially this, you know, one concern um, is the is the unknown effect or impact of the strains that may be more infectious. We're starting to see more of that. The virus has mutated. So it's possible that there's, you know, we're, we're experiencing sort of a race between the vaccine and these more virulent strains. And the only way to protect ourselves is to really remain as vigilant as we can with the physical distancing and the facial covering. Um, what I see happening over time, you know, the more doses we get, the more people are protected, the better off we are. And I, you know, I'm seeing if we're able to get say 30%, 40%, 50% of our, our, our community vaccinated over the next couple of months, our case rates are gonna start becoming lower just based on vaccination. The concern is that as that occurs, if people start to relax more, that subset of people who have not been vaccinated will be at a higher risk of infection. So our infection rates as a community may not change um, if we don't maintain our vigilance. Um, but if we're looking at, you know, our goal as a county is to have everyone vaccinated who wants to be vaccinated by the end of June. And I think that's a realistic goal. So that the summer would be a lot different if we're um, if we achieve that goal. Supervisor Milton Peters. Thank you, uh, Dr. Willis. I also want to express my appreciation for what you've done in this challenging time in setting up the Mass Vac Center uh, here at Civic Center. And I, I'm heartened with your forecast that a month from now, uh, most people with the highest uh, rate of, for death will have been vaccinated, which is where we need to be. And so along those lines, I um, would like to ask that we prioritize also in this coming month, uh, those people who are younger, who uh, have comorbidities and underlying conditions that put them at significantly higher risk 
uh, in that we work with the private healthcare providers to develop some kind of joint criteria by which we can, we can identify these people uh, and get them in, into the vaccination lines. Is, is this something that um, public health might consider doing? Absolutely. You know, our, our tier framework is, is inherited from, from ACIPs from the CDC um, and then goes from California Department of Public Health and then we are the local implementers of the state plan. Um, and so some of what we're able to do or not able to do is really determined by the state. Um, right now, where medical conditions come in to, to the prioritization scheme is actually further down the road. Um, you know, having said that, we have close relationships with our hospitals, with our healthcare providers. Um, when we get to those, you know, 50 plus, um, which may be as early as the next tier, um, we would have people with chronic, you know, a, a invite them to offer their members that have, or their, their patients that have our risk of much, much more serious outcomes based on immunocompromised status um, to be vaccinated. And that's, you know, again, these are all right now that that is being negotiated at the state. The, the criteria continue to be refi refined um, and we will, we will continue in, in Marin County to apply the best evidence, you know, in it. and there's clear evidence that people who are uh, younger but may have certain conditions would be worse off if they were infected and, and that's, that's an important consideration. So we will do everything we can within what the state allows. Good. And then would you confirm that our vaccination interest form captures information about this comorbidity and underlying condition? It does. Yeah, that's right. The, the vaccine interest information form has a, has a list of, of those conditions that we know are associated, based on the evidence, know are associated with worse outcomes for, for COVID-19. Um, so those, those people can be identified. Yeah. And it's a yes, no. It's just if you have any one of these conditions, it's a yes or no, and if those, if it's yes, then we have a now we have a list of people who have those who are at higher risk that we can re reach out to. Great, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Rice. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Wills. Um, really appreciate the flexibility as you and your team um, respond to changes that are happening pretty quickly and sometimes not with a lot of warning um, from the state. And the vaccine uh, vaccination dashboard is really helpful as well. Um, I have two questions. One with regards to that information form that um, Supervisor Moulton Peters just asked about is um, I just want to want some assurance that folks understand that they don't have to have filled out that form in order to receive notification. And let me phrase that differently. Do you have to have filled out that form in order for public health and our healthcare system to know that you're waiting out there for a vaccine? No, absolutely not. It's just it's just an added an added uh, you know safety, and I think it, it helps. I hope it helps people feel reassured that they're that they're recognized. The you know, your healthcare provider is really your your first line of defense here, um, and and it, you know for Kaiser they have you know proactive outreach to all their members. Um, every every person that is tied to a healthcare provider um, should be expecting to hear from their healthcare provider. What the plan is for their vaccination, and we're working very closely with the healthcare community. Um, we're also, you know, through forums like this, through U.S. supervisors, through the media, through any other distribution channels we have. We have regular town halls with the community, just letting people know where we are in the process, how many we vaccinated, which tiers are coming up, who fits into those tiers, um, and if you know, through all those mechanisms, um, you know, we're hopeful that the, the community will will know where we are. And the fact is, you know, what's you know, what's I think inspiring about this is that no one is left out. You know, we're, if you're part of that group, it doesn't matter what your insurance status is. It doesn't matter which city or town you live in in Marin, um, you're up. And if the vaccine is free, um, and we're, you know, we've got, we'll have multiple places where people can get vaccinated. All right. And then, so my, my second question is related to communication and the importance of, I know you're all working hard. Uh, and trying to inform the public in different ways. Um, and, and that includes all the partners and that consistency of message is just really, really important. And um, I, I, it's, I think it's probably been a struggle and, um, but I, we can't emphasize enough how important it is that whatever communications are going out are aligned um, across those providers. 
and then um, specifically even around um, at, at our vaccination site because uh, because of the confusion and changes in, in process, I'm sure people are showing up down there at our Marin Center site thinking they can get a vaccination and or maybe they have an appointment or registered for one and they're showing up. I actually had an email last night that someone showed up with an appointment and the place had already closed down and, or, and there was no information there as to what had happened. So uh, we have to work really hard on the communication side. Um, and I'm just, I'm wondering if you have any, um, any, pro, any can say anything about that and frankly, what can be done at the Marin Center site or elsewhere just to uh, make it very clear that you need an appointment or you don't need an appointment. You know, what, what's the criteria when you get there for being able to walk in the door and get a, get a shot? Yeah, it's it is it is an appointment only. So the, every every vaccine that's being offered in Marin is by appointment only. Our and, and, and our way to ensure that everyone has access is to help everyone get an appointment. Um, it is and, and that is because this is a vaccine. Again, it's a high maintenance vaccine. It's two doses. We need to we need everyone. You know, there's an electronic system. The state requires that we use a platform where people are electronically registered for that dose, that second dose is scheduled. And we need to know, so that we're not wasting vaccine, we need to know exactly how many people are coming in to be vaccinated on a given day. That's impossible to manage in a walk-in structure. The other concern about walk-ins is that it, it leads to crowding. It leads to you know conditions where um, transmission, we're still obviously remember that we still, COVID-19 is circulating. So vaccination sites themselves are at risk if they're not really well organized and managed. So having an appointment structure is, is, is vital. All right, again, we're, we're working to make sure that everyone has the ability to, to, to get that appointment and transportation to that appointment, or we are going, bringing the vaccine to them. It is not a walk-in site. Um, the state, you know, we are, as I said, we are implementing a state plan. And, you know, California is a huge state, 40 million people. They've they've built tools and data platforms to try and support this process. Not all of them are performing as well as they should. <laughs> and one of them is the, is, the, is, the, is the scheduling platform called PrepMod. They're modifying that scheduling platform. So some of the bugs that we've experienced are actually related to, that, to the software itself that's related to the scheduling platform. We're working with that, you know, and, and we're, we're eager. There was an announcement this morning from the state regarding the vaccine distribution plan and the rollout, we know that there's gonna be a, that prep mod module is gonna be fixed and replaced. And some of it, we've had some of the, some of those issues where someone has shown up and the, 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 there's no appointment is actually related to the, the platform itself. And we apologize to, to anyone for that occurred. Our, our, our process is to reach out to those people and reschedule them. Yeah, so I'd encourage to have information on site actually for when that sort of thing is occurring and whether it's a sign board or what have you. But um, thank you again. And um, that's all my questions for now. Uh, Supervisor Arnold, I think you're saying no today. And I'm going to go to public comment then now. Al, would you bring in the commenters, please? Yes, the first two speakers are Raleigh Katz, Abby, and Elias Karkabi. Raleigh, please uh, unmute and you have uh, the option to share video. Good morning. <laughs> Raleigh Katz, Marine Association of Public Employees. First, I just want to thank and commend and recognize all the county employees who have been working incredibly hard on this. I was speaking with a member of ours who's a nurse, speaking to her last night. She's been very much involved now in vaccination. As she's been so busy, we haven't had a chance to talk union stuff at all. So I just want to say that. Secondly, I want to share my thoughts, and I think all of you are saying this, and Dr. Willis, about how we don't get lulled into um, f slipping back. I know we're all going crazy. I'm looking forward to actually being at a meeting in the person with all of you and all the regular speakers. But I, I don't think we're going to be done with this in 90 or 100 days. I, I think President Biden should be encouraging us to wear a mask, not for 100 days, but for 200 days or more. And I'm not sure when exactly we'll get to herd immunity. And I, so I, I just want to say that physical distancing, uh, mask wearing, etc. And then on vaccination, um, a few things. One, I think I heard Dr. Willis say that one can get the vaccine where one works. So if one is an essential worker, a school teacher, a county employee, a grocery store worker, who 
lives in a different county but works in Marin, can that person get vaccinated in Marin? Secondly, do we have any idea <clears throat> how quickly we'll have more vaccination? We know there's talk about Johnson & Johnson, uh, or is it still very uncertain? And then lastly, there's been some talk about changing the distribution system, not from all of these tiers, but simply age, uh, regardless of whether, if you're 50, let's say you go 75, then 65, then 55, regardless of your essential worker. So if Dr. Willis could share any thoughts on that. I know my own personal experience checking with Kaiser when the 65 and older came out, um, it was a four hour wait. Then a couple of days later, it was, sorry, don't call us, we'll call you. And now it's only if you're a healthcare worker. Thank you. The next speaker is Abby. Abby, please unmute and you have the option to share video. Hi, um, I was, I have a question for Dr. Willis and I was wondering if you could clarify which if any valve cover face masks, those are the face masks with the valve in front are allowed under the public health order because there was confusion in a grocery store that I went to over the weekend and I saw somebody wearing a face mask that was kind of like the one in your slide, which I think was just a lighthearted image. But, you know, I was alarmed because I didn't think that it was offering protection. So I called the manager and the manager explained to me that she thought some valved covered face masks were allowed under the public health order, but the website has a big X through it. The CDC website has a big X through it. The WHO website has a big X through it. And so I was wondering if you could clarify that, please. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then I was just curious, especially with, with the previous speaker, if there's any movement towards, I, I know people don't like this, but any type of compliance video training for essential workers, particularly grocery store workers, so that everybody's on the same page and we can all be confident that we're operating with the current set of standards because as we know, everything changes from time to time. So thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Elias Karkabi. Elias, please unmute and you have the option to share video. Hi, good morning. Um, and thank you for your presentation, Dr. Willis. Um, my, my questions are uh, regarding uh, the SARS-2 uh, virus that we're currently experiencing a pandemic from. Um, it has been established that this virus is transmitted through airborne transmission, in addition to uh, droplet and fomite transmission. Um, one thing that uh, that you said a couple months back was that um, in 95 masks were available for the general public and you cited those for um, uh, in particular for students who are planning to travel um, by uh, some kind of indoor means like an airplane or a train or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so for an airborne virus, uh, cloth masks are not sufficient for protection. Um, in fact, cloth masks for an airborne virus are at best a temporary emergency measure. Um, almost everyone is wearing cloth masks and many of those who wear cloth masks work indoors um, and are at very high risk for infection through indoor transmission. Um, so if N95 masks are still being rationed for healthcare personnel, uh, the public in Marin County needs to know what Marin Health and Human Services is doing to get more N95 masks so that our non-healthcare essential workers can be safe, um, especially those people working indoors, um, as cited by the last caller, people people working in, in grocery store lines, um, you know, are at very high risk for transmission and also um, exposure to, to airborne, um, to the airborne virus. Um, and if there are enough N95 masks to provide uh, our essential workers with uh, masks, then employers need to be immediately making those available. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is caller with telephone number ending in 705. Please unmute. Caller, please unmute.
caller and uh, go ahead. Yes, hello, this is Margaret Moody. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. So I applaud the comments of Elias and Abby and others. I feel frankly that this entire presentation has been um, an exercise in duplicitousness. It feels that to me there's a strong dissonance between your discussion of vaccine availability, which is not yet robust, and your willingness to open outdoor dining, beauty salons, and social bubbles. Of course, the county has the power under California law to impose its own strong public health measures. It does not have to follow Governor Newsom's lead. We are precisely at the point in time where we need to be more careful to hold on for just a few more months I ask you, why is it that a certain level of death and permanent disability are acceptable to Marin County authorities, right when we're on the verge of widespread vaccination? I'm a lawyer, but I used to work in the restaurant business here in Marin County, and I can tell you at even our finest restaurants, they are notorious for exploiting vulnerable workers who are concentrated in the Latino community who live in multi-generational households in the canal often. The restaurant business flouts regulations even in the pre-pandemic. This is also very common in the construction industry where they take advantage of their vulnerable employees. Um, my mother's husband recently had an accident. They've had to have home health care workers those home health care workers work in multi-generational households. My point is that even people who work at home, we cannot isolate ourselves necessarily, especially when there's a medical emergency in the family. Uh, my mom has been unable to get a vaccination so far. And even when she does get the vaccination, of course, she'll have to wait the two to three weeks between the two shots, as well as a, another two week period after that booster for maximum immunity. You need to wrap so it up, again, please. Why are we opening up? Why are we opening up just as the vaccine is here? And okay. I've heard no mention thank, of long-term Thank you, we, we've gotten your question. People have thank you. The next speaker is Eva. Eva, please unmute and you have the option to share video. Thanks so much, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, just add, as someone who um, has worked for many years in the restaurant and hospitality industry in Marin County um, for some of the you know, best known and best loved institutions, that the restaurants are serially out of compliance with uh, requirements for worker safety. And this is particularly uh, notable with regard to the lowest paid uh, labor workforce within that, within that industry, which is Latino, mostly Latino. I've seen serial abuses, both in terms of, you know, safety violations, um, forcing pe people to work through injuries, um, which compound, you know, compound those injuries and then, and then all sorts of other health issues accrue. Um, I've seen a lot of wage theft uh, from Latino workers. I've even seen a lot of wage theft um, from, from female servers. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very exploitative industry, but I have serious questions about reopening outdoor dining when we can't even establish whether the masks that we do have, cotton or N95 or K95, are going to be functional in say the very hot and humid environment of the dishwash station, which is usually manned by a Guatemalan or a Mexican immigrant, very low paid. Um, and those masks are gonna stay dry for approximately five minutes because of the enormous amount of spray um, from the dishwash machine and the, the sprayer and the humidity. And so I just, I just question why we are sacrificing working class people of color because Marin County, absolutely white people in Marin County cannot open a bottle of wine by themselves. It just, it's, it's very, it's very naked. Thank you. 
President Rodoni, there are no additional speakers in the queue. Okay, thank you, Al. Dr. Willis, would you would like to answer some of those questions? Sure. Um, I'll start with, with Raleigh's, um, Raleigh's questions regarding the um, potential um, shift in the state strategy. You know, I think we've um, you know, learned that we're, we're waiting for the, you know, it's hard to predict, I would say, uh, in terms of what, how the state strategy m might change. Um, and we know that, that it will. Um, and that's one thing we do know is that this strategy continues to be refined. So I wouldn't assume that the tier framework that we have now up would necessarily be the final product. Um, the, 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 the complexity of the, of the original framework where you're trying to reconcile age, occupation, medical conditions in complex algorithms to invite certain people and exclude others from vaccination um, is, is not, is not working, um, and it was you know it's been confusing to to both local health officers as well as the public. So with, with that in mind, it's the state that is considering. I know simplifying the framework, really focusing on that epidemiologic risk that I just shared with you regarding age and feathering in certain occupational risks. Um, we know. You know, Marin, we have 23,000 residents above age 75. Between age 65 and 74, there's about 33,000. Um, and then above, between age 50 and 64, there's about 60,000. So we're over 100,000 residents just by virtue of age. If we're talking about uh, residents above age, age 50, we have some of the, we have one of the demographically oldest uh, populations of any, any in the state. So even with that, with that fundamental organizer, if we go from 60, you know, next to 65 and then to 50, um, we're talking about nearly half of our residents. Um, so that would be one strategy. And then to, to Supervisor Moulton Peter's point, um, adding in medical comorbidities into those would be another alternative. Um, we will, we, we expect that at least the next cohort would include age 65 to 74. Um, and would expect to move forward with that group um, in Marin County. Um, the question regarding, uh, oh, and then Raleigh also asked about the uh, county. So yes, so we will vaccinate anyone who works in Marin County, um, in, in Marin County, uh, that's regardless of, regardless of their occupation. We've been moving that way with, with our healthcare workers. Um, and that's because, it, 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 I mean, anyone who works, so that you know, if you work in a grocery, et cetera, um, you're you're on our on our rosters, and we will vaccinate you. Having said that, if someone has a is, has an opportunity to be vaccinated in the county in which they live, based on some other criteria, they should approach it opportunistically and 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 jump on any vaccine that's being offered. Um, valve masks. So there the uh, there are some masks that appear to have a valve that are not actually that the kind of valve that we're concerned about. Masks that have valves. Most masks that are, that have valves. Are, are, are not helpful for COVID-19 because they allow someone to exhale through the valve and exhale the par particles. And then when they inhale, that valve closes. It's sort of the opposite of what we're looking for. So, but there are some masks that have the little disc on it that may look like a valve, but it doesn't function as a valve. It's a virucidal disc. Um, it's like an N95 with a little virucidal disc that someone breathes through, it still has the filtration. So that's why it's, it's harder now to just look at the appearance of the mask and know whether or not it's the right one. Um, the question about cloth masks versus N95s, um, you know, cloth masks are incredibly effective from a, from a public health standpoint. Paper masks, cloth masks, the masks that people are using in, in routine everyday use are incredibly effective at preventing transmission of COVID-19. Um, it is probably the most important tool we have available to us in our everyday lives. Um, and, and it's encouraging when I'm out in the community, I see by and large, that's what Marin County residents are doing. They're, they're wearing those masks. There are some subsets of individuals who should be wearing the N95s. Right now that is still our healthcare workers who are around aerosolized procedures. I think when I mentioned N95 in the past with regards to unavoidable travel, first of all, the message was not to travel. And then the second was, if you cannot avoid traveling, uh, mention that in some gift shops and air airports and others there, you can find KN95 masks for sale. And those are not, it's not a bad idea to, to 
use that when you're in a setting where there might be unavoidable close exposure if that mask is available. We will, we will offer, we follow the CDC. Again, local public health implements federal and state guidelines with regards to public health. And, and, and we have not, the CDC, nor has CDPH, California Department of Public Health, recommended the use of N95 masks occupationally for people outside of very limited settings, especially in healthcare. If and when they make that step, we will, we will implement that locally. Um, and then to the question of, um, are, we, are we moving too quickly to allow our sectors to reopen? Um, given, you know, uh, given the vaccine is, is just rolling out and, uh, and we're seeing you know, more infectious strains. We've, what we've seen with these, these waves is that there's a, a trend established and we're just at the beginning of what looks like a very reliable downward trend. At every step, we are trying to measure the harms of COVID-19 infection versus the harms of restrictive policies. There's more and more evidence that the things we've done to prevent transmission are themselves creating health harm, even you know, outside the social harm, but health harm. Um, suicide rates have increased. There's other, other harms associated with the restrictions that we have employed socially to reduce transmission. And it's, it is a very delicate and, and difficult balance between those things. And um, when we, you know, again, that's where our personal behaviors are the key. Um, you know, we can't, we cannot legislate control, uh, no matter what we do from a policy standpoint, especially the longer this goes, the more and more slippage there is, the fewer and fewer people who end up really sticking to the policies. They're very difficult to enforce. So at the end of the day, this really comes down to our own everyday behavior. Um, and um, with the freedoms that we now have to engage in outdoor dining, um, to do more social gatherings with our friends and family, outdoors. Um, it's going to be up to us to do those things in ways that are informed by our knowledge. We're a year into this. Everyone knows what to do. Um, you know, we know how to prevent this and we've already done it before. We, we controlled the surge in July. We've controlled the surge now and we need to continue to do that while we reopen to try and, um, you know, get, get the economy back, back on its feet. Thank you, Dr. Willis. Really appreciate you being here today and answering those questions. So now we're going to go back to Matthew Heimel and Dan Eilerman for a federal COVID relief stimulus proposal. 